Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the show with schools here in Ontario set to switch from online learning back to in-person learning tomorrow. Joining me now to answer some questions that viewers of the show have is infectious disease specialist, Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Um, Dr. Bogosh, um, I'm gonna start out with a question from Leslie Swartz who wants to know, um, she's a teacher and obviously has concerns about going back to school and, and getting Omicron, um, but she's wondering more specifically if she doesn't remove um, you know, her tightly fitted um, N95 masks uh, at all while in the school, um, you know, she eats when she is in her car. So basically doing everything possible to um, limit her chances of getting Omicron. Um, is, is it still likely um, that, that she could get Omicron and kind of speaking from, you know, the, the situation of doing basically all the protective measures that, that she is able to? Right. So I think it would be less likely. But again, nothing's 100% perfect and we don't live in a risk-free world. The steps you can take to reduce your risk of getting this infection are of course getting vaccinated. And we now have actually pretty decent data that three doses of a vaccine does reduce your chance of getting this infection. And of course we know those who get infected after three doses have milder symptoms, but yeah, it, you know, it might, it might uh, there's about a, depending on the data you read, maybe about a 50 to 70% uh, uh, vaccine effectiveness for th a third dose. That's pretty helpful. It's not amazing, but it's, it's certainly, it's not nothing. And then of course the high quality masks as well, like N95s are, are great as well. But remember those are uh, unfitted masks. Uh, so they're, they're good, they're high quality, there's good fit, there's good filtration. But like in the hospital, we are fit tested for our N95 masks. Uh, and most people in the community are not. That doesn't mean they're useless by any means. That doesn't mean they're useless. It just means that they're not fit tested. So like I can guarantee that most people in the hospital have been fit tested, have, a, uh, have, have the right mask for the right face. Whereas in the community, you, you know, you've still got a very good quality mask. Uh, but again, you, you've got to have a, a, a good seal and a good fit. And then of course, there's other steps as well. Better ventilated rooms. I just, you know, you can't, it's hard to say this, but like, I think the right way to approach this is it's not a moral failure if someone gets this infection. This is a really transmissible infection. You can do everything right and still get this infection and no one would bat an eye. Now, I think the chances are lower if she, this individual keeps her mask on the whole time, but it's not 0%. And maybe I'll just kind of follow up on, on you with, you know, you mentioned vaccines specifically for uh, teachers, um, but what about vaccination for students? Because obviously in terms of um, if, if you look at the vaccine percentage rates at, at which children are getting vaccinated um, across Canada, um, you know, the number of children who have received both of, of the two doses um, is quite low. I believe it's just over 3% of children. And obviously a lot of that is probably because the interval between, you know, their first and second doses hasn't been long enough. But um, how do we ensure that, you know, that vaccine rate continues to grow? And, and what should we do if, you know, over time, you know, it, it has been more time since children have been able to get their second doses and that vaccine rate number doesn't go up? Right. And I think uh, just to add to that, one of the telling points is that, you know, the vaccines for the five to 11 year olds have been around for a couple months now. And the rate of first doses is still pretty small. I mean, I think across Canada, it's about 45% or so. So we just haven't, you know, we've seen some people come out and get them and some people are very eager to, but there's a lot of other people who are either not going to get it or just waiting for more time. And like anything else, you're here to change behavior. And of course, if you want to do that, you have to have honest messaging uh, about what this vaccine is and about you know this, the safety and the effectiveness of this vaccine. And you have to really communicate in an age, language, and culturally appropriate manner. It's not sufficient to have you know a political leader or a public health leader have a press conference at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on mainstream media networks and expect people to you know, come clamoring for the vaccine. It's not, a, it's not enough to just make a policy and say, oh, you know what, you're eligible, age five to 11. If you really want uptake, you have to have uh, behavioral experts, social scientists and behavioral change experts, and, and really communicate effectively in an age, language, and culturally appropriate manner. If you target the right audience with the right message and the right language, uh, and you make it easier for people as well. So bringing vaccines to people rather than bringing people to vaccines, like putting them in the schools, 
putting them in the community centers, et cetera, you know, you'll see a, probably a much larger uptake, but that's a coordinated effort. And, you know, I think we've seen a little bit of this, but I don't think we've done enough to really get those numbers up as high as we can. Okay. And um, as a next question from Raina Saria, who's actually a student who's going back to school, um, just wondering uh, regarding your concerns uh, as it relates to the quarantine length for children when they, uh, if, if they do test positive and, and what might be the consequences of not reporting COVID cases to parents as the government has, has decided to done, do. Yeah, so certainly we know that uh, some people might still, let's say someone gets COVID. Uh, yeah, it's true. A lot of people will be transmissible for a, a day or, or two before they develop symptoms. Uh, some people will be, you know, most people will be pretty transmissible for a couple of days afterwards, but with time that gradually peters out and the ability to which someone can transmit to others peters out with time. And usually by about 10 days or so, you're not going to be transmissible to others. Of course, there's exceptions. Um, and, you know, obviously if at five days, uh, some people will still be transmissible to others. I think that's, that's pretty clear. It's not like a magic number where no one's transmissible after so I think, you know, you've got to be careful. you got to be careful here. And some people might be coming back uh, outside of uh, isolation and still be able to transmit to others. Now, you can probably lessen that with every single person wearing masks, with better ventilation and with crowd control. But yeah, I mean, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, some people will come out prematurely and, and will, will ultimately infect others. Uh, if you want to add some safety to that, you can increase the length by a couple of days. You can add rapid testing as well. Those are all just strategies to help ensure people coming out of isolation aren't, aren't transmissible and don't pose a risk to others. I forget the second part of your question. Sorry. It's fine. Uh, we can just go to the next one. Okay. Um, so um, when we look at, obviously, the government has provided N95 masks for um, teachers and, and for educators, but... Um, and Amy here, um, who is has the next question, I think raises a good point, um, talking about is it still worthwhile to upgrade um, to N95 masks for students if they're going to do things like, you know, remove them um, at, at lunchtime for, for snacks and, and lunch regardless? Okay, so what was the name of this person asking the question? Uh, Amy. Amy. Amy's got a fantastic point. Like, Amy knows her stuff. <laughs> good for Amy, right? The masks, obviously you want a high quality mask, right? And the two Fs of quality meet are fit and filtration. And 95s are that, right? They're, they have usually a very snug fit and they've got uh, good filtration. You know, listen, some people are talking about N95s like it's the be all end all. I think it's fair to also acknowledge that they're expensive. Not everyone can afford them and they're hard to get at times. And if there's other ways you can have a good tight fit and especially around here and around the sides, and good filtration that aren't meant N95 masks. And so I, I don't want people to think that if you don't have an N95 mask, you're you know doomed, because you're not, you're absolutely not. You have good fit, good filtration, and you'll be okay. Uh, the next point though is the mask is only good if you wear the mask. And you talk about lunch, but you can also talk about how many times have you seen people take off their mask to cough? or to sneeze, which is exactly the point why you should have the mask on in the first place, or people fidget with them. And again, I'm not picking on N95s. People do this with all the different masks. Some people are saying maybe it's more common with N95s because depending on the fit, they're pretty snug against your face. But but I think all masks, like any mask, doesn't matter the one, uh, they're, um, you know, if it, they're only as good as, as they can be if they're on your face. So, you know, people are pretty gung-ho about N95s. And I think they're important. Like we have to acknowledge that those have a good fit and they have a good filtration, but the best mask is the one you're going to be wearing. And if someone has an N95 mask that they're just tugging away at and they're not comfortable and it's not on their face, it's not as, it's not good because it's not going to do it's, it's what it's supposed to do. Better have something that you're going to be wearing the vast majority of the time and not tugging away at or pulling off. I'll just, as, as a final question, there's obviously schools are returning tomorrow. How confident are you with, you know, the, the measures that have been taken and just overall, um, because a lot of the questions that came in were just overall, how confident are you with kids going back to school tomorrow? And, and do you think it will be safe with the measures that have been taken? Right. So a couple points. First of all, there are measures taken. And I think we have to acknowledge that those measures are going to reduce the risk. 
Like that's clear. Masks, sure. Better ventilation, of course. Priority vaccination for educators, administrators, students, perfect. That's excellent. But again, could there be more? Of course, absolutely there could be more. So I don't think it's fair to dichotomize this into safe, not safe. It's degrees of safety. And obviously you can take it, uh, turn it up and have more degrees of safety there with, with testing or with transparency over, over outbreaks. I mean, there, there certainly could, you certainly could increase the degree of safety, but it's not like the current measures aren't going to do anything. I mean, that's, I think that's unrealistic. And, 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 you know, I think it's also fair to say that even, even in a world of unlimited resources, you're still going to have outbreaks, right? Like you are, this, it kind of stinks, but that's just the reality of the situation. This is a very, very transmissible variant and humans predictably behave like humans. And those masks are going to be on sometimes and off sometimes, and people are going to be gathering closely at times and, and, and not at other times, but you know, I, I obviously there, there's, there is more that could be done for sure. We have to acknowledge that, but it's not like the current efforts aren't going to do anything at the end of the day. There's going to be outbreaks in schools. We know that. Every, I hope we know that because that's that's what's going to happen, just like there were before. But now you've got a more transmissible variant. I think the steps taken with better ventilation, uh, better quality masks, priority vaccination, vaccination for the five to elevens, like these are all going to help. But obviously, um, it's not. It's not. It's not going to be perfect. I think the other important point too is. You, know, you and I are both in Ontario, but uh, Canada is a big place. In Ontario, there's 2 million kids going back to school tomorrow if the snowstorm doesn't prevent that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can't make blanket statements for 2 million people. Like, you just can't. Like, some kids can't go back. Maybe they have a risk factor for a severe illness. Maybe they go home to a family member who has a risk factor for severe illness. There, there's always going to be circumstances where some people just can't, shouldn't, won't go back. And I think we have to have very, a lot of flexibility for remote learning options because there's just some people that aren't going to go back and everybody needs access to education. And, you know, there's kind of two challenging roads forward. And here you got to take the least challenging road forward, but it doesn't mean it's without challenges. That's a long-winded way of saying there's going to be outbreaks. There's more that can be done, but it's not like what's done isn't without merit because there's a lot of merit to what's been done. All right. Well, Dr. Bogosh, thanks so much for joining me. And uh, it's been great chatting with you. And yeah, thank you again. Have a great day.